Good evening, everyone. And thank you all for joining us for this event tonight that is co-sponsored by the Department of Jewish, Islamic, and Middle Eastern Studies and the Danforth Center on Religion and Politics. I'm Dr. David Warren, a postdoctoral research associate here at WashU. And before we begin, I would just like to thank my colleagues at the Danforth Center and Gimes, particularly Sandy Jones and Stephen Scordias for assisting with the organization of the event and helping make it possible. So tonight, it really is my great pleasure to welcome you for this special screening of the new documentary, The Judge, which follows the journey of Khaloud al-Faqih, the first female judge appointed to a Sharia court anywhere in the Middle East, or indeed actually the first woman to be appointed to any religious court in the region, because Jews and Christians have their own religious courts as well. The Judge was first screened at the Toronto Film Festival and is directed by Erica Cohen, who I'm very pleased to say will be joining us for the panel discussion that follows this screening. So just to give you all a quick rundown of how the evening will work, we'll just watch the film together now, and then immediately afterwards, we'll have a panel discussion with Erica and my two colleagues, Professors Tazine Ali and Nancy Reynolds, for about 45 minutes with plenty of opportunity for discussion reflection and questions. That will then bring the formal part of the evening to a close, but I hope all of you can stay afterwards just for some light refreshment and further conversation outside as well. So with that, I hope you enjoy the film. I'm very pleased to welcome Erica Cohen, the director of the wonderful film we have just had the pleasure of viewing. And so Erica is an award-winning director and producer who was named by Variety as one of 2017's top 10 direct documentary filmmakers. And in addition to The Judge, other films Erica has directed and produced include a 2015 Emmy Award winning film, In Football We Trust, which explores the unique faith and culture that ultimately drives young Pacific Islander men to join the NFL. And among Erica's other activities, Erica has served as a US ambassadorial film scholar to Israel-Palestine, and in 2013, um, Erica founded Idle Wild Films, which to date has released three feature documentaries and numerous other audiovisual content. Also on the panel tonight is Tazine Ali, who is an assistant professor at the Danforth Center on Religion and Politics. Tazine is a scholar of Islam and gender, and her current research focuses on female religious authority, primarily in the United States. And also with us this evening is Professor Nancy Reynolds. Nancy is a historian of the modern Middle East, and among her publications, Nancy has written extensively on 20th century Egypt. And her most recent book is titled, A City Consumed, Urban Commerce, the Cairo Fire, and the Politics of Decolonization in Egypt. So just to get things started, I'd just like to invite Erica to speak for a few minutes, just to give us some insights into the film and really how it came to be. And afterwards, Nancy and Tazine will speak for a few minutes also to draw out some key themes. So thank you, Erica. Thank you for having me. It's really lovely to see all of you, and I'm very excited to hear your responses to the film. It's been a, a wild journey uh, over the past couple of years since we released The Judge at the Toronto International Film Festival, and uh, Judge Khulud was there and very much enjoyed the, the world premiere of the film as well. So fast uh, forward, or actually rewind, uh, to 2012 when we started this film, I had received a Rotary Ambassadorial Scholarship to teach film in Israel-Palestine and continue some of my postgraduate research in Islamic feminism. And one day, a dear friend and colleague invited me to this Islamic reform meeting that was happening at the Palestinian Authority headquarters in Ramallah. And I walked into this room being very conscious of the fact that I was one of the only women in the room, and I was seated at a table uh, full of men with tarbushes, the hats that the judges and the sheikhs wear. And all of a sudden, Judge Khulud walked in. And she had this truly unbelievable, remarkable presence that kind of radiated throughout the room. And I 
kept finding myself being drawn into what she was saying as she talked about how Palestine's legal challenges disproportionately affect women and how can you create uniformity in law when there is no uniformity in Palestine as a country that's spread out and is divided and occupied. And so after this meeting, at this point, I didn't know she was the first woman judge to be appointed to any of the religious courts in the Middle East. So I introduced myself. I said, Judge Khulud, I found myself really drawn to what you were saying, and um, I just wanted to introduce myself. And she said, well, what do you do? I said, I'm a filmmaker. She said, interesting. Why don't you come to my courtroom? <laughs> and I, I would say maybe this whole time Judge Khulud had her own plan. But the moment that I walked into her courtroom was the moment that I knew this needed to be a film. I mean, here she was part judge, part marital therapist, part lawyer, as you see on the screen. And she's adjudicating somewhere between 40 to 60 cases a day. And the efficiency and the command of the room, it, it, I was blown away. And I also felt like the cases that she was seeing are not so dissimilar to the cases that we see in the US in our family courts. So at the end of the day, I said, Judge Khulud, you know, your personal story is amazing. Um, I found what you do in court really, really, really captivating, and I think that your story could provide a more nuanced understanding of Sharia for a Western audience in addition to uh, Middle Eastern and Muslim audiences, and also challenge rapidly increasing global Islamophobia. She said, well, I've been waiting for someone to come along. <laughs> so I think for Judge Khulud, for her, you know, why she wanted to do this film, it was really to, in addition to the reasons that I mentioned, she really wanted to inspire young women and girls around the world to pursue leadership roles in their communities, despite whatever cultural norms or traditions might exist, and also to really use this as a platform to educate Muslim men and women about women's rights in Islam. Thank you so much, Erica, uh, for being here and for this important film. Um, I think women's roles within the Islamic legal tradition is such an interesting topic in its own right um, in terms of how religious traditions change over time and evolve. Um, but this topic has also occupied um, the attention of a broader American public for the better part of the last two decades. Um, where the general perception is that Islam and Sharia specifically unequivocally oppresses women. Um, so Khulud's story here is a strong, charismatic, instantly likable uh, Muslim woman fighting for gender justice within the Sharia is not a story that we typically hear um, in the US. So I think that the climate of Islamophobia, as you just alluded to, um, makes, this, makes her story even more compelling and more timely. Um, and it makes her the, her uh, persona as um, this pioneer and a role model so important. Um, but in many ways, her story is also really powerful because of the ways in which it fits into a broader history of women's varied tradition uh, relationships with the Islamic legal tradition. Um, not necessarily as a pioneer or as an exception, but as a part of a longer tradition of women being involved in authoritative legal roles. And so this is something that I just wanted to briefly contextualize. Um, and so there have been a lot of fluctuations in terms of women's religious authority throughout Islamic history. Um, and one consistent role that they've played is the role of Hadith transmitter. Um, and so Hadith are sayings of Muhammad that have crucial legal import in terms of generating Islamic legal norms. And Hadith transmitters have historically played a very critical role in passing down collections of Hadith across generations. So the factor that really determined whether or not a woman could occupy an authoritative role was her social standing and status. So for example, the wives of the Prophet Muhammad and his female contemporaries who came from elite backgrounds were viewed as these undisputed legal authorities based on their Islamic knowledge. Um, and importantly, early Muslim biographers characterized these women as strong and assertive and really active in the public sphere, much like we see Khalud portrayed in the film. Um, and then there's a period where um, 
we see this sharp decline in women, female authority figures um, following in the period following the, the Prophet's death. Um, and that had to do with the, the field of Hadith uh, transmission becoming more specialized and requiring extensive travel, that the prevailing cultural norms um, that limited women's mobility kind of precluded them from having that formal training. Um, but then, then we get to this other period by the end of the 10th century where we see this resurgence of women in authoritative roles, um, particularly ones from elite backgrounds who are the daughters of scholars um, who receive these advanced educations. They would have these, their own students and their legal opinions would be uh, sought after. And then they went on to become the wives of other jurists. And so you start to see this consolidation of a Sunni elite uh, through these families of legal experts. And then there's also cases in the 19th and 20th centuries of women in various positions of legal authority in Iran and Iraq. And I just raise that here um, to say that the general concept of Muslim women in positions of legal authority within the Sharia is not born out of a contemporary moment, um, nor has it always been tied to a specific set of conservative or progressive values. Um, so this is just a way to think about how Khulud's story in Palestine is continuous with Islamic history and also really novel in its particular context and to help us think about frameworks through which to interpret these stories of these really singular figures and their individual characteristics um, and reflect on the ways that this might draw our attention away from broader long-term social trends and various factors that also contribute or hinder their success. Thanks, Tia. Yeah, good evening. Can you hear me back there? Spencer, can you hear me okay? Good. <laughs> Thanks, you guys all for coming. I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this. I just want to say, Erica, thank you. It's a beautifully rendered film. Clearly, you are um, well-practiced at this art, and it's really fun to watch. So I have a lot of things I want to talk about about the film. It's raised a lot of really interesting issues for me, uh, just about the filmmaking and about the shooting and the kind of reenactments that go on. So anyway, there's a lot. But I only got three minutes to talk. <laughs> and a lot of you know me, so that's hard for me. So um, I just was going to kind of go into one particular set of questions, which for me is about the Shreer Court as a place of um, a subject for the film. So as you heard, I teach uh, 20th century Middle Eastern history. I work on Egypt. And um, in fact, historians think a lot about Shreer Courts because they provide a lot of really interesting things historically. So the film has a lot going on about women's rights. We should definitely talk about those things. But in terms of thinking about the Sharia court as a space, um, it's a really interesting, there are really interesting transformations that you allude to that go on in the course of the 19th century and the 20th century about the way that the scope of that um, court's jurisdiction changes. So the way that the courts become only really a space for dealing with personal status law or family law. Um, and this is one of the trade-offs that happens in the, as some of these nat new nationalist post-colonial governments are becoming um, increasingly secularized. They sort of limit the scope of what becomes Islam in public into these really specific spaces of the Sharia court. As a historian, it's also really interesting. So there are interesting transformations that happen around that and the way that law is reconfigured. So really, as a legal practice that is much more plural, so as you probably know, there are multiple kinds of uh, schools of law that have Sharia courts. So you might have different kinds of, she talks about being a Hanafi judge, but there are other ways in which people would kind of shop around for different um, rulings or different advice that they would get from different courts. Um, the courts, in fact, are places, this is referred to in the film. There is evidence from the Ottoman period that Christian and Jews did go to Muslim courts to um, have rulings that they might take back into their own communities or get um, other opinions. Um, so they're quite interesting spaces that depend mostly on oral testimony and think about witnessing and think about evidence in ways that are very different from what happens um, in the 20th century as this really um, pretty big field of legal practices becomes codified into a code of law. And it becomes much more text-based. Um, evidence becomes much more documentary. So a lot of the things you see going on in the court about looking in a book and finding the rules and applying the rules are kind of um, processes that are actually undergoing a lot of change in this period. As a historian, there is a really important way in which Sharia courts also figure in teaching women's history, which I'm doing right now. But I have another class that I, many of you took with me in the spring about law, in which we really look at the Sharia court record as one of the primary sources for women's experiences, um, documenting them over time and preserving them because it turns out women of all classes went to the courts all the time in the way that we see in the film. And their, um, their 
visible to us with a certain kind of agency through these court records. So it's an interesting question for me. The film raises this over and over again. Does she give a different kind of justice because she's a woman? So it's kind of an interesting question. If we had had these records from the 19th century from courts that were actually um, adjudicated by women, you know, cases adjudicated by women, would we have a different record of women's experiences? I think that's an interesting counterfactual question to kind of raise. I will say that the timing of this film is really convenient for me and that I'm um, teaching a film, uh, basically a film-based class on women and revolution. A number of you are sitting through the films with us and we just watched a film for yesterday's class, which is probably one you know called Divorce Iranian Style, which is another uh, version of this story. But instead of taking the pioneering woman as the sort of main figure, the film is based in the court itself. And so again, you have uh, cases that come before the judge and there's a lot of uh, mediation that goes on. It's interesting for me to think about kind of what does it mean to focus the film on a particular person as opposed to a particular space. Although your film does a little bit of both, even though the title sort of suggests it's going to be about her and it sounds like she's a powerful personality, you do a pretty good job actually of pushing the story away from her whenever you can. Um, not that she's not likable, but just it raises interesting questions for us about how we understand change and agency um, in, in um, the past or in the present. The other film that we've been watching recently is another one you might know, which is also based on the question of weddings and marriages, which is called Rana's Wedding, um, which is also filmed in uh, the West Bank and in uh, East Jerusalem. It has a very different way of dealing with Palestine's um, fragmented sovereignty and the Israeli occupation. And so I'm just also curious to think a little bit about what that means. Uh, there are some references here. There's some filming of the barrier, uh, separation barrier of the wall, of uh, some ways in which space is cut up by the Israelis, um, the occupation in the West Bank, but, uh, and there's a reference to checkpoints, but there's, that doesn't come forward in the film um, as much as uh, it could have been. So I was just curious to sort of raise that as a set of questions too. I'm really actually interested to hear what um, people in the audience have to say, but I'm not moderating. You are. <laughs> Yeah, thank you um, to all of you. So we'll just open the conversation to questions from the audience now. So yeah, Ian, if you could take this microphone, we can start passing it around. Um, just to get us started, I wondered, Erica, if you could just tell us a bit more, perhaps in hindsight, what was maybe for you the most significant or difficult choice you had to make as a director while you're creating this film? There are so many challenges that I could <laughs> talk about and difficult decisions that um, we needed to make. Um, I'll t talk about a few of them because it's hard to pinpoint just one. Um, one of my favorite scenes in the film was of Judge Khulud and her best friend, Judge Esmahan, who was the second judge to be appointed. And the two of them were together at um, Esmahan's house with their kids, discussing the need for Sharia to modernize, how to adapt to Facebook, dating online, DNA, um, and how to address custody issues when um, oftentimes women are, are working outside of the home, in Palestine in particular, even more so than the men. So um, how to address custody within that framework. That scene was, was unbelievable, and it was really, really hard to cut that, so that was a, a difficult decision to make. Ultimately, it kind of didn't fit with anywhere within the film, so maybe a DVD extra. Um, I think Palestine as a character in this film uh, was a very conscious choice for me and uh, it took a long time to figure out how to do that. I wanted to transport viewers into a world that many of us may never have access to. And Palestine I wanted to portray in a way that that you won't be able to experience unless you're there. So how to create this warm, inviting, kind of multi-sensory experience with Palestine. So that we did that by going around and actually creating a soundscape of insect noises and honking and dust and wind and really created a unique soundscape so you could hear what, what it's like in Palestine and in different towns and the different calls to prayer. And then through color correction, through the warmth and the inviting nature that you get uh, in Palestine. And then also I wanted to show 
Palestine in a way that many of us have not seen through drone aerials. So how would you put a drone up in occupied Palestine? That's a tough question. <laughs> Um, but we figured out a way to do that, uh, but we're very aware of the challenges in that you can't have a drone anywhere near a separation uh, wall, a checkpoint um, within certain roads. I mean, there are pop-up checkpoints at any time, so this clearly would get shot down. So the only place we could really shoot was in the middle of Arab villages or major cities. And we were aware that people might come running out of their homes concerned about what kind of surveillance might be going on because those are the drones that, that Palestinians are typically exposed to. But instead, people came running out of their homes with cake and coffee and said, thank you so much for showing the world a Palestine that they don't get access to. What government agencies you actually had to interface with through the process of making this film? Did you were you working primarily with the PLO, or were you did you interface or uh, work with the Israelis at all? Uh, could you maybe talk a little bit about what that experience was like? So the question is, what kind of agencies or government organizations we had to interface with um, in order to have access or to make this film? Um, the only time that we interacted with Israelis was in getting the footage out um, and getting in to Palestine, which was difficult um, and a whole other story in itself. In terms of access, although Judge Khulud opened her doors to her home and her court with open arms, we had to get permission from each Qadi al Qada or Chief Justice each time a new one was appointed. So. Sheikh Taisir was very, very excited about this film and very supportive. Sheikh Youssef, not so much, and Dr. Al Habash. I had to wait two weeks, literally camped outside his office door before he would see me. And I waited and waited and waited and waited for that for that meeting. And finally he uh, probably was just getting sick of me being in the waiting room. He <laughs> allowed me to come in for a meeting and I told him why I wanted to make the film and um, he finally agreed. So each time it was a challenge in being able to move freely about the courts. And then once we were in the courts, I mean, as you see, it's a small room. There's not freedom of mobility in terms of camera and also you're dealing with really sensitive issues. So every time someone would come in, I would briefly introduce the, the, the film and ask if it would be okay to film their case. And a lot of times people said yes, and a lot of times people said no, but you can film hands, feet, you know, objects, or you can record my voice, but please alter it or change my name. So then the challenge became, you know, how do you create these angles and these, uh, you know, how do you create drama in a, in, a, in a court case that you actually can't film? So that's where the recreations came in and how to visualize those moments where either there was a murder in Khulud's courtroom or there were sensitive uh, cases where we weren't able to depict the people who were in that case at that time. Oh, that... That was really 
an important point for me to show this from people working on the inside. I mean, I a little bit of personal information. I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah, um, which is predominantly Mormon as a non-Mormon, someone who came from an interfaith background, part Jewish, part Christian. And um, because of the predominant patriarchy in um, uh, at that time in Salt Lake City and the pressure to kind of identify with one particular faith, I really felt like feminism within a religious construct wasn't, wasn't possible. Um, and uh, that later drew me to my interest in Islamic feminism and really kind of digging through history books and finding women who had been left out of the conversation, who had been a part of the founding of various religions, and given the time that we're in, I think it's most important to kind of shift our attention to Islamic feminism and really pinpoint the amazing women who have um, been left out of this con of the conversation of the founding of the religion. And so I wanted Hulud's voice to be front and center in that process. And for her, I once, I once asked Hulud, uh, mostly because my team member team members were really curious about this question. I said, you know, Judge Khulud, do you consider yourself a feminist? She said, of course. And I said, do you ever find yourself at odds with the Sharia? And she said, no, the problem is not with the Sharia. It's with the interpretation, or rather the misinterpretation of the Sharia. And we have to work within the system to create change. And you see that, you know, you see her kind of revolutionary change in the groups, you know, in the women's group where she's talking about, you know, women having the right to kick the men out of the house too, and the responses that she gets to that. Um, I also did want to show that perspective, though, through Hanana Shrawi, who says, you know, essentially this is a place that men have dominated, but at the same time, if women are at the forefront of leading these courts, then I'm okay with it. So actually, to pick up on that point, Suzanne, if I could just... Um... Yes, I just wanted to pick up on that point very quickly and ask you, Tazine, um, the theme of honor and honor killing comes up in the film in a very significant way. And so could you talk a little bit for us just about how that figures into the study of gender and Islam? Sure. You know, I actually really appreciated the way in which um, this film really shows women's voices representing violence against women. Because so often the concept of honor killing in the U.S. context um, is basically a, a label to use to explain um, intimate partner violence in Muslim contexts as a unique form of domestic violence. Um, because there's political expedience here in, in terms of the trope of the subjugated Muslim woman, um, you know, has been successfully mobilized to execute militarist, US militaristic agendas abroad. Um, and so this politically charged context, I think, often leaves scholars and activists um, who work on gender issues in Muslim contexts in this really precarious position. And so I'm really appreciative of the way that it's handled in the film of letting women speak for themselves. Um, but it's such a precarious context for scholars and activists um, who work on these issues because their work is always at risk of being co-opted by um, a militaristic, imperialist agenda um, that can and, and does bring further violence to, to Muslim women in, in the Middle East. Um, so this has been this ongoing challenge of how to engage in gender justice without further fueling anti-Muslim sentiment. And as, as you so clearly point out, that one of the goals of this film was to kind of address this rising phenomenon of global Islamophobia. And so at the same time, to dismiss the discourse of honor, killing, and honor and shame um, as always only imperialist sensationalism is to undermine the activist work and the work that we see here in the women portrayed in the film, um, who themselves use this language um, and understand the discourses of honor and shame um, to be relevant as a subcategory of patriarchal control and power over women that leads to these horrific cases of murder um, and other forms of domestic violence. So the conversation regarding um, honor killing would look really differently in the US um, if it was not treated as a foreign issue that just happens elsewhere um, to brown women. Um, 
that is somehow distinct from intimate partner violence in the US. And as you point out um, in your, some of your earlier remarks that a lot of these cases have these universal themes of what happens in family courts in the US. And so I think what's important for us as scholars and students um, and consumers of, of media and film is to understand the broader geopolitical context in, in which ideas of women in Islam are circulating and think critically and ask questions about how and when the, the terms of honor killing get used and who gets to speak about them and um, to what ends. Question my test. I um, also want to say something on that. Uh, we use the term honor killings in quotes because that is actually not what it is. And Rima, um, the lawyer in the film, you know, clearly states it's murder, but it's like they try and use this honor crime defense, but ultimately they get sent immediately to the criminal courts and then it's up to um, that the, the victim to go or the survivor um, to go through the Sharia court to be able to get um, compensation or to be able to get uh, some sort of legal familial resolution. So, so the question was about if, you know, as a woman and as a Jewish woman or someone with a, a Jewish last name, what kind of challenges did you face? Honestly, I think being a woman in this context worked to my advantage because when I approached the chief justice and asked for access, I think I was completely underestimated. I think oftentimes women around the world are underestimated. And so in some way, this woman with a tiny camera hanging out in the back of a courtroom is really not very threatening. Had I been someone else uh, with a large crew and a fancy camera, that might have been different. In terms of my last name, it didn't change anything. I speak Arabic um, and... Um, in terms of differences of opinions, uh, you know, the, probably the most interesting interview with, was with Hossam Adin. Um, and the in there was that Tahrir, the marriage officiant, that was her professor. So she came with me to this interview, and um, Tahrir and Khulud actually argued before this. Khulud was saying, don't change anything about you, Erica. Go in there and be yourself. And Tahrir was like, I think you might want to change a couple of things and be a little bit. <laughs> so they, they had this interesting conversation. Anyways, I went there and, you know, my job is not to debate Hossam Adin. He has a platform. He's a very well-respected professor. And I wanted to better understand where he was coming from and what um, kind of, you know, informed his thought. After the interview was over, we definitely debated, though. <laughs> So in the film, you highlight the, um, for you like post that um, the scholar basically who's providing like some form of legal or sharia like refuta um, refutation to the presence of women as judges, right? But then we also see from um, the actual like court system that the presence of women in courts. That I don't know if it's implied that there is some form of like bias against them, or if it's actually like they're saying it's just like the test scores or whatever. Um, but basically, the, um, the question is, do you see like in other countries, is it likewise, or is there a very like strong 
legal refutation or refutation from the legal scholars within the other Middle Eastern countries, or is it also more of a um, systemic, like, prevention of entrance or, like, uh, like lowering of, like, the position of the female judge, like, we, when we saw that she was given, like, just, um, you know, like, paperwork to do? Um, so I'll, I'll take this in, in different parts. In terms of um, Palestine, it's actually interesting because Gaza is under the Maliki Islamic school of thought, which um, does not uh, believe women can be judges within the courts. So it's a very, it's because of Palestine's complex history and cocktail of laws, as Khulud describes it, it's really difficult to create this uniformity of law and uniformity of justice. Um, other Islamic school of thoughts have different interpretations on whether women can be judges and um, in what context. Um, it's, it's interesting because in Malaysia and the Sharia courts there, women are allowed to adjudicate divorce, but are allowed to adjudicate everything else. Um, it really, it, it differs from region to region. In terms of Khulud's situation, the chief justice, um, both chief justices, Sheikh Yusuf and Dr. Al-Habash, have used every opportunity, any, any possibility of wrongdoing by Khulud to retaliate. And actually now, in response to the film, um, uh, Dr. Al-Habash is uh, not pleased that he's... Um, he could have been a bigger character and some other people could have been bigger characters uh, and so has really used any opportunity to retaliate against Khulud and um, has moved her to different courts and has made things very difficult for, for her, banned her from speaking to the press at times and prevented her from going to certain screenings. So it's been a very, very challenging situation. I don't think that that part is unique to Palestine. I think that is very universal um, women's leadership is highly contested. It's not just Khulud's colleagues or um, some scholars. I mean, you look at people on the street who have differing opinions about whether women should be judges or not. And what was interesting is that was the same conversation in Palestine that we were having here in the U.S. during the Hillary Clinton campaign. Hello. Um, so I also found the film quite interesting, and I have a question regarding um, the impact on the society. Um, we have seen in the film that 80% of the divorce files were signed up by women, uh, if I can remember correctly. And um, in connection to that, we also are the film also kind of um, discussed a bit or introduced this theme of experience that seems to be um, also an important um, thing in court when a woman is acting as a judge in front of uh, women and also um, the judge Kalut is um, acting as an advisor outside uh, the, the court and so I was just wondering um, yeah, how how can uh, gender and how can uh, a female judge maybe um, um, kind of update uh, the concept of gender in the uh, in the society? Um, yeah, what do you think about that? Is there like uh, this? power in court and of the law when you have a female female judge? I think in Khulud's case, I mean, she first was a lawyer working with survivors of domestic violence and felt like she could best catalyze change by becoming a judge in the Sharia courts and actually started announcing publicly that she was going to become the first woman judge many years before she actually did. That was her goal. That was her mission. And one of the things that she understood in working with survivors of domestic violence was that it, there was no place 
for women to come forward with the most intimate details of their lives, or even children to come forward with the most intimate details of their lives um, and talk about abuse and challenges. And um, she felt like her presence would help change that. And it actually has dramatically. Uh, We've seen statistics go up um, for a number of cases that are brought by women in Palestine to the Sharia courts before Judge Khulud and her colleagues and after. In addition to that, I think it's crucial, this is not just Khulud, this is not just uh, judges in the Sharia courts, it is crucial to have leadership that is representative of the population they are supposed to serve. And until the leadership or judges um, reflects that population, there can't be justice. That's just, it's just not possible. Um, and I also want to say one more thing about the marriage contract, because I think we really focused on the marriage contract a lot in this film, because that's one of the ways that Judge Khulud really felt like she could create more um, opportunities for women to know their rights and to um, guarantee that women will have rights moving forward. I mean, the marriage contract is pretty interesting because you can say where you want to live, the kind of lifestyle you want to have, how many kids you'd like to have, how far in education you'd like to go, whether it's going to be a monogamous or um, polygamous relationship. You can you can decide all of these things up front. And in a lot of ways that provides um, more protection for women in the long run. Well, I, I might just say one thing about that. I, I think that there, this has been a really important uh, initiative in a number of places in the, in the Middle East about making marriage contracts a lot easier to work with and so providing like actually check boxes. Um, the Egyptians and others have had these um, campaigns so that you didn't have to have the knowledge to write the conditions in there. Um, but it raises, an, it, so it's a really important tool and it, that's great to hear that there have been these outcomes. And it's also interesting though, I, I felt like you lingered here about this in the film. Just the presence of having access to that doesn't necessarily mean that social change will follow. Like it's clear in those moments when the couple walks in holding hands and then the judge asks them, or the registrar asks them, you know, are you gonna put any conditions in the marriage contract? And they're both sort of like, oh no, we're all fine. This is a lovely new moment we're sort of stepping into. So when you think about like what really is the power circulating and who has the ability to speak and negotiate on behalf of um, themselves or their family members, it's a, it is a much more complicated process to disentangle. So that was something I appreciated in the film. I don't know if that was deliberate, but it felt like um, it's a complex process. Yeah. They have changed, so. Hi, so I was sort of wondering about, there was a moment in the film where they were talking about the way that young women are educated on their faith. And they said they were learning about the devil and there was a picture of a woman. Um, and I imagine it's very hard when there, it seems that women have to have a different interpretation of their faith to sort of like be able to work and have whole jobs. Um, and so how would that affect young girls growing up who might feel ashamed um, that if they were to, you know, um, it almost seems like sometimes like, you know, women don't think that it's their religion too, right? Because if they have to have a different interpretation to believe that they have equal rights, um, I can see a lot of internal conflict happening there and young girls feeling like it's not their right. Um, so how can the education and the implementation of that teaching kind of better affect women and young girls growing up? I feel like this is a a really universal question that um, spans across all faiths and all cultures. And really, I'll speak about this from a personal perspective. I think that when you, it's not religion, it's patriarchy. And when you are shown imagery of women as subordinates, you are shown imagery of women as creating trouble or being a problem, 
that's incredibly difficult to overcome. And I think that's one of the huge barriers that we have across cultures, across faiths. Um, and one of the most important ways we can solve that is by having positive role models that look like us who are challenging those norms, cultural norms, traditions, and really can be there as mentors or as figures that we can see and look, look to. Okay, well, thank you. If there's no more questions for this forum, I will just bring the formal part of the evening to a close. But there is food outside in the corridor, I believe, so we can continue to have some refreshment and further conversation. And so a big thank you to Erica, to Zine, and Nancy. Thank you. Thank you.